this entire bogey of Hindu terror came about at a time in the country when India was going through a very, very sensitive and difficult time. So this incident in which you have the chief of Simi, Safdar Nagori, and the fellow who conducted the blast, Arif Kasmani, and his associates saying, we have this blast, kiya hai, and Pakistan claiming we have done it, that incident, whose, which the investigation file is almost complete, one morning becomes a Hindu terror case. Suddenly, both are at par. There is one jihadi terror which wants to impose jihad and there is a Hindu terrorist who wants to counter the jihad. Now we are at par. Good evening everyone. Most welcome. Uh, most welcome Smita ji. We are honored and happy to host Smita ji. She has been a reporter and a journalist at a time when there was this Kargil war happening in India and the 9-11 twin tower attacks happened in New York City. And she started reporting on defense and security and terrorism and politics and current affairs, which was the story, she says. These were the stories over there. And this was a time when the army men and the defense personnel were a little ret reticent to even speak to women. They were not even so comfortable. Then, during her work, she has travelled the length and the breadth of the country, reporting on such things. She is well versed in many languages and she's worked with uh, platforms like Amar Ujala and ETV and Hindustan Times Group and Denik Bhaskar and Free Press Journal. Now, she's an advisor with Prasar Bharti. So, thank you for that very kind and charitable introduction. I've really not done so much as you gave the brief. I'm just like any other news reporter. Uh, working in Delhi with a very humble life, trying to make both ends meet. Ghar ka chula jalane ka jo sangharsh hai. I am into that and there are lakhs like me here and other cities of the country. But uh, I am sorry if I may not be too com Even though I am a television person, I am not too comfortable with this format of speaking alone because our interactions always involve a dais where many people are uh, putting comments and asking, but I'll try to do my best. So since you've given me a cue to start with the context of writing the book, yes, I do believe that in every case, I think, but most particularly in my case, this book came out last year, towards the end of last year in November 2022. But this book was actually born in my mind, perhaps a few years prior to that, which is also the case in most books, I think. We'll, most people, when they write something, they mull over it, they think over it. I don't think a move, book happens in a day. So, in my context, I would like to explain why there was a need to write this book. Considering it is, a sub, it is not a fiction, it is not a personal experience, it is not even a biography. This book is something that the Indian media has been reporting for many years now. So when it was all out in the media, in the public domain, in newspapers and television and digital, why was there a need to put it in the format of a book? Since you have all been reading about these details and there are, I got a lot of feedback from people when the book came out and they knew most of the things. So then why a book in this, on this subject at all? That is because uh, I happen to be, it's all incidental because I've been born in this country at such a tumultuous time that all this about uh, the so-called Hindu terror happened when I was a hardcore full-time news reporter like so many of us and I reported whatever came out in the public related to Hindu terror every day like some of my other friends and colleagues. So. Uh, I don't know how many of you would uh, think of it in that sense, in that perspective, but all of us need to remember that a journalist or a news reporter in the field is not exactly a stenotypist, okay. He or she is not supposed to just take dictations from sources, whether it is an agency or a government or a police or a political formation. A journalist, even though is supposed to report what comes out from the sources, is supposed to apply his or her mind 
we are not stenotypists who will take down whatever is told to us and reproduce it in that sense to give to the public because I believe that is dishonest journalism because you have a right and a responsibility to give your consumer, your reader or viewer, whoever the true picture. In the case of Hindu Terra, I am afraid this was not happening. What was happening is dictation was being given from certain quarters, mostly our agencies and then our, uh, the, uh, you know, I mean elements in the government associated directly or indirectly with the government and it was all being reproduced in the media without anybody seeming to apply their mind or perhaps the impression created was so, you know, uh, so detailed and so profound that journalists were not able to see through it and understand that a kind of a bogey was being created. But I stick to my opinion despite all challenges to the same thought that Hindu terror was, has been and is still a bogey that was created. There has never been a such thing as Hindu terror, but it was projected in that manner for a long, long time, not only in India, but globally. So coming back to your point that, you know, how did the context of this book coming out happen? So it so happened that even in the course, now I had to do my job also. I was a news reporter at the end of the day. I was not a philosopher. So while I was writing the stories, things just did not add up. You know, every day the brief that we were given, it would not add up. And I, because of my background in reporting on internal security and terror with the by dint of starting my career in JNK, I had a better understanding of these things compared to my, some of my other colleagues, not all. So now this is not a comment on their competence, but I am just saying that I could see through certain things. And I realized that nothing was adding up. I will give one very small example before I come to the case of Colonel Purohit, on which there were a lot of questions. So why did you write on Colonel Purohit? So before that, I would like to say, you know, uh, what I am saying is there were incidents which had happened in the past and those incidents had the investigation into those incidents had gone to a very advanced level, almost at a concluding level in many cases. And suddenly overnight, those same incidents were labelled as Hindu terror one fine morning. Clearly upturning what was the line of investigation till that time. On this, I will give a very small example because it became a worldwide sort of discussion. That was the case of the Samjhauta blast. Now, Arif Tasmani is on record. Those of you who have been following these cases already know what I am going to say. It is for the younger generation, the millennials who are not following so well that time, they need to know. So, Arif Kasmani is on record that he conducted the Samjhata blast. And Safdar Nagori, who was heading the Simi at that time, the notorious Safdar Nagori, is also on record in his confession saying that he was being handled and facilitated and helped by people from across the border, okay, most particularly the Lashkar, but there were others also. And he organized the entire setup and the logistics to conduct the Samjhata blast. Now, all this is on paper. The lady, because those for those of you who remember, the Samjhata blast occurred at a railway station in Haryana, in the Panipat district, very close to a station called Diwana station. Now, the, the SP of Panipat at that time, she is an, she, she, a retired IPS officer. The lady had all the evidence at her command. Right on the day when this happened, close to mid, I mean, just after midnight, I would say, that early that morning, she still, I mean, if anybody goes and, you know, if you look her out, if you search her out, she lives a retired life now, she will tell you step by step. It was an open and shut case. Now, why I am giving the example of Samjhata, Colonel Purohit, by the way, is not associated with the Samjhata blast. But I am giving the example of Samjhata blast to tell you how Hindu terror bogey was built up. So, this incident in which you have the chief of Simi, Safdar Nagori, and the fellow who conducted the blast, Arif Kasmani, and his associates saying, we have blast kiya hai, and Pakistan claiming we have hai, 
that incident whose which the investigation file is almost complete one morning becomes a hindu terror case so this example is important to tell you how suddenly overnight everything became hindu terror and then suddenly after a matter of few years there is no hindu terror anymore it was like it was like a balloon which came and burst which raises the question that something was going on now it is very easy to be wiser in hindsight now i can talk here i can stand in iic and tell you that hindu terror is a bogey and all this was built up however please imagine the situation when it was happening when we were in the middle of it when every morning there was one big headline saying ek aur hindu terror ho gaya ek aur blast ho gaya so this impression was created about this uh, set of loony hindu men and women who were crazy and they wanted to destroy the harmony of our country and uh, they hated uh, a certain population a segment of the population and they wanted to turn india into a crazy you know fascist communal country and they were so powerful that suddenly overnight they had started conducting blasts in all kinds of cities and trains and buses and masjids everywhere that is one that was one trigger to suspect this entire thing the second trigger was as i said first was that there was no hindu terror one fine day a hindu terror rises and then it it's off that is one the second trigger which led me to think of you know looking at it in a different way was the question that this entire bogey of hindu terror came about at a time in the country when india was going through a very very sensitive and difficult time that is there were terror attacks in almost every city till before that we were used to having violence and incidents in some parts of the northeast india in some pockets in central india and the jammu kashmir which was a state and is now a union territory suddenly and this was the period of the upa1 if you want to judge it in a political way the regime was upa1 so there ek din faizabad court mein blast ho jata hai another day there is a blast in kashi vishwanath then there is a blast in again in ayodhya then in lucknow then delhi more than once mumbai of course was the prime target of terrorists every time it looks like they just wanted to finish mumbai and then there is ahmedabad there is uh, jaipur so this long list of incidents it looked as if suddenly the country had become a sort of you know uh, Uh, as if the terrorists were running free and they had a free run across length and breadth of the country and nobody was there to stop them now the police is always the same is my experience of all these years the police is mostly the same and the investigation agencies are always the same if i am allowed a slightly cavalier language i will say police jaanch agencies aur isse jude jo pure suraksha wo hain wo sarkari ghode hote hain वो वही करते हैं जो उन पे सवार है वो कहता है दिस इज अ वेरी स्ट्रीट वे कैफिलियर वे ऑफ पुटिंग इट आई कैन पुट इट इन अ फाइनर वे बट इट रिमेन्स द ट्रूथ रिमेन्स वॉट आई हैव सेट सो देर इज ओनली सो मच दे कैन डू एंड वाई एम आई एम सींग दिस बिकॉज वेन द स्ट्रिंग ऑफ ब्लास्ट स्टार्टेड हैपनिंग दे हैव अ मल्टीपल रिपोर्ट्स इन द एम एच ए इन द स्टेट ऑफिस यू सी द कॉम्पिटेंस ऑफ एन ऑफिसर डज नॉट increase or decrease with the political dispensation the competence remains the same but the the quality of delivery changes depending on the uh, the political will of the government of the time so officers were competent then they are competent today or not competent either way however you look at it so there were competent officers in the mh at that time they were looking at everything very closely very keenly observing analyzing and they had some very very sinister conclusions all those conclusions were being hammered into the political leadership every day but there was a clear indication to go slow or to look the other way now this raises a very important question the country is threatened by terrorists by enemies of the nation why are you not interested in taking action i mean which government doesn't want to protect its own citizens so this was a difficult point and this along with this suddenly 
comes Hindu terror and a lot of incidents clearly showing in every possible way that it is jihadi violence suddenly becomes billed as Hindu terror. So, this is where the things started raising questions and I started studying about it. And in the course of some time, it became clear when the cases were reaching nowhere, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, if you look at the string of uh, accusations, they are really, really serious. But none of it was uh, sort of getting proven in any court, anywhere. And then strange things happening started happening. People started dying in strange, uh, healthy, fit people started dying. And then uh, nothing got to be proved and more and more names were included. And the most funny part was, every day, people of a certain ideological thought, their names were flashed in the newspapers that, oh, X will also be called for invest questioning. X, Y will also be called for questioning. First of all, none of them were called for questioning. Secondly, a couple of them who were called, kuch bhi nahi unki questioning mein. And they were let off because there was nothing to do. Which means, more than Hindu terror, a talk of Hindu terror was being created to keep the pot boiling. Push a newspaper headline every day and let the people chew on it. You know, this is what was being done. Now, who took advantage of this? All over the world, nobody talked of Colonel Purohit or Sadhvi Pragya or in Swami Asimanand or a dozen other accused. People started talking of the Hindu as a terrorist. So Hindus are this bunch of extremist people who are out to kill Muslims in their country and some of them are so powerful and they have the support of a certain uh, ideological thought and they can engineer a blast wherever they want. So suddenly the Sanatini becomes a terror minded loony uh, person, man or woman. Now what is the benefit of getting this done? Suddenly, you have created a false equivalence with Islam, jihadi terror. Suddenly, both are at par. There is one jihadi terror which wants to impose jihad and there is a Hindu terrorist who wants to counter the jihad. Now, we are at par and a false accusation has been created. So, what have you done? In the, in the effort to create a bogey of Hindu terror, you are giving a safe passage to the jihadi terrorists. Usko bhool jao, pehle is pe kaam karo, ye jada khatarnaak hai. And why I believe this to be the design? Because there is a politician of the Congress party who is on record, who said that we have to be more worried about Hindu terror. So it, nothing is incidental, nothing is coincidental. Now in hindsight, you can add up everything. And funniest of the funny things, there is a fellow called Hafiz Saeed who goes all over the world and he is quoted by big newspapers of the West saying the whole world should be worried about Hindu terror and the world and the UN should take some cognizance of it and do something about Hindu terror. Hafiz Saeed hame kehne laga, terrorist. I mean, that was the pits to which we had descended and I have mentioned it in one of the beginning chapters of my book to see in the matter of few months, it was not even a year. In a matter of few months, this bogey had become so big that Hafiz Said started calling us terrorists. And yet nobody was worried. So, to create the bogey of Hindu terror, so that you build a false equivalence against jihadi terror, in the process, you give them a safe passage and you put some people in jail and create an entire political narrative out of it. Thankfully, friends, when nothing works, it is the wisdom of the people that works. There are times when our agencies, our governments, our system, our security, everything fails. Even international bodies fail. I think they fail before anybody else. At that time, it is the, the common, the humble, the innate wisdom given to the common citizen which comes to the rescue. And the common citizen was able to see through it. It has been my experience while traveling the country that it may be a sort of a talk for some time, 
But nobody in this country ever bought the Hindu terror theory. Nobody really bought it, except perhaps a few people who had a certain political uh, design in pushing it. Even they didn't believe it. They were pushing it for political gains. But the common Indian on the street never bought the theory of Hindu terror. They never believed it. They always thought it was a political game. However, I'll come to my book. Now, a lot of all this, all of you already know. So why write this book? Because you see, the question was, there is the serving army officer. He is not even retired. He is very much in his job. And his record, his uh, assignments, his reports, his entire career shows he will go very far, right up to the top in the Indian army. Now that is one thing. Second thing is, he has just, now I will not reveal those details here. They are very sensitive security details. But he had penetrated so deep into the system, this nexus of jihadi terror, the Maoists, the fake currency, and a certain elements of the political establishment. He had penetrated so deep into that, that it had become necessary to push him off the track. He had to go. Now, there are always some elements in every organization, in our agencies, in el elsewhere, in, in each of your offices you will have those people who, for, who will always have an extra grind for certain political game benefits, for small professional benefits. They will like to, you know, they like to become the tool in the hands of bigger powers. They don't realize that uh, what, a what a big chance they are taking for small benefits, but they are there always. So all this made a very heady mix. The fact that Colonel Purohit had become too inconvenient for them and he was not afraid to tell the people whatever he had found and on their face. Secondly, this false equivalence had to be created. So there were meetings in the government. One of them has, one of those meetings has been reported in my book headed by the then Home Minister and some other officers and political persons, where it was told that please create some cases jisme Hindu ho. And the concerned officer says, sir, hume nahi mila hai. Aapko mila hai, koi case to bataiye. So they said, aisa kaise hota hai? Koi to hoga. And they said, sir, nahi hai. So the meeting ended with that. They wanted to force an officer to write a report of Hindu terror. The officer said, I have not found anything. If you have anything, tell me. Then they made their people work and some of it was built up. Eventually, these cases came out. Those officers couldn't do anything. And this whole bogey was created. It, the purpose was to make it a big thing and it did become a big thing for a certain period of time. Let us not fool ourselves. Hindu terror was a big sort of narrative for a certain time. Now, what I can add here is, if you look at Malegaon, if you look at Samjhauta, if you look at uh, certain incidents like Ajmer and other smaller incidents, it was all a build up to 26-11. The whole game plan was to make 26-11 an example of Hindu terror, the biggest example of Hindu terror. And considering the scale of that terror attack, by the way, Mumbai attack continues to be the biggest terror attack on Indian soil till date. The scale of the attack, the preparation for the attack and the people who died all put together. So what happens? You build up this case that there is Hindu terror going on and then you create a situation where Mumbai attack becomes uh, labelled as Hindu terror and forever in this country the Hindu becomes stained with that, uh, that brand, that, uh, you know, that label, that thappa of being, killing their own people. Now why I am saying this? All of you have read Rakesh Maria's book. Even if you have not read Rakesh Maria's book, you know that Kasab was dressed up all as a regular Hindu student. Forever, this land, this country, this society should remain grateful to one man, Tukaram Umle, 
who laid down his life, but he saved the Hindu community from getting that brand of Hindu terror. Had Kasab not been caught alive, Mumbai attack would have been labelled as a case of Hindu terror forever. So the catching of Kasab alive and the fact that later on when the political situations changed, some people had the courage to come out and give out, speak the truth. And also certain things which happened in that period, finally, they were not successful in labelling Mumbai attack as a Hindu terror case. But if you read that book, Mumbai Hamla RSS Ki Sazish, which was launched with great fanfare in Mumbai by some well-known politicians of the country, there have been any number of uh, petitions in Mumbai High Court and NIA Court in Mumbai demanding a ban on my book. Nobody wants a ban on a book saying Mumbai Hamla RSS Ki Sazish from India to US to the CIA to FBI. Everybody knows who did Mumbai Hamla. But that book is still go available in the market. Nobody demands a ban on that book. But there have been half a dozen petitions against my book, which only brings to light what we all already know. It is floating in the public domain. It has been floating in the public domain, if you go and look at it. So why did I decide to put it together in a book? Simply because I was speaking to my friends and distant relatives and younger generation of reporters who are now coming into the profession. They don't know anything about Colonel Purohit. They know Sadhvi Pragya because she is an MP, but they also don't know what is the exact, I mean, what is the exact case that she is facing. And Swami Asiman and then all, they have not even heard the name. Now, friends, this is hardly a matter of few years. Abhi se log bhool gaye hain. Imagine what will be the impression in the minds of people in this country 20 years later. But you search Hindu terror on the internet, you will find any number of data and material telling you what is Hindu terror. Nothing to tell you that Hindu terror is a bogey. Our information platforms are so sort of, uh, you know, uh, tilted. There is a set of information on one thought and nothing on the other thought. Why? Because nobody is writing. So today I know about it, you know about it, perhaps you know about it. A couple of youngsters also may know. Ten years from today, when they search the internet, it will seem that India was this land of place where all Hindus were terrorists and they wanted to finish off a community and there was a serving army officer who became a terrorist. So just to put the record straight, I am thankful to God and all our readers and supporters who have bought my books in great number. But had nobody even bought that book, even if one fellow had bought my book, I would have been satisfied because I don't want to die without putting these facts on record. That is all that I had in my mind when I started writing the book. Everything else that has happened is incidental. My only problem was that when somebody searches the internet, only one set of view is not there. Uh, what will happen to our youngsters who will become citizen, uh, aware citizens in 20 years? We are leaving them for them. We are leaving them for them who were hidden in the UPA. Tha. And I challenge each of you, please go home and open your systems and search for Hindu terror. You will find only one set of reporting. So, the political situation in the country may have changed, but the enemies have not changed. The enemies are still around, they are very much there, they can raise their heads anytime again. So, therefore, we have to consistently keep up this effort to put our view on the record, that doesn't mean it was easy. It certainly wasn't easy for many reasons. Number one, nobody wanted to talk about it. Everybody wanted to talk about the politics of Hindu terror, but nobody wanted to talk about the case. Not even people who were closest to the colonel. Either they served with him or he mentored, even boys whom he mentored by himself. They are so, you know, sort of under pressure, they didn't want to talk about it. Even retired officers refused to talk about it because retired officers also have some concerns. So just getting people to, and I didn't want my book to be a political theory book. I wanted it to be about the details of the case, which you will find when you read it. So the, the nitty gritties and the details of the case, nobody was ready to divulge. And more than anybody else, Colonel Sahab, I want to add one thing about Colonel Prasad Purohit here before I end. He was nine years in jail 
He continues to be in court every morning. Half of his day is spent in the law court because he is fighting his case without any support from any quarter. Nine years, of course, he was a jailbird. And when he came out, he fights his case every morning, evening, afternoon. But any of you meet him, I can say this on record and I can repeat it as many times as I am asked. I have not seen a patriot like Prasad Purohit. It is impossible to believe it. Considering what he went through, considering he gave his life to the Indian Army, and considering what he went through after that, he continues to be a die-hard patriot. He loves the army like a religion. He cannot hear a word against the Indian Army, no matter what you say. There is zero anger on his face. There is zero disillusionment on his face. He is just such a positive and determined person. He continues to fight his case. He doesn't even see the fact that from 2008 till now, how many years have passed, nothing has been proved and the case continues to go on. He doesn't even complain about it. So, there are men of steel, there are women of steel who are standing in this country. We have to support them if we can't do anything better. We cannot change the law courts, we cannot change anything else. We should at least talk about it, tell our children about them or write about it, talk, converse about it, spread the word. More than Colonel Purohit, we must also think of the family. And I am reminded here because this happened a few months ago. There is a young man, emerging activist who is in jail under UAPA in concern with the Delhi riots. And recently there was a story in some national newspapers, half half page stories, so much newsprint we waste on these things, saying the girlfriend of that uh, under trial feels very upset and she is so upset that her favorite is Chinese food and she doesn't eat Chinese anymore because he is in jail. It is so sad. And then people talked about, they went on talking about on television and those stories were flashed for days, digital mein to abhi bhi chal raha hai. And there is a serving army officer who gave his entire career to this land. His wife, his two kids, the younger boy was a toddler when he, was, when he went to jail. When he came out, the boy had already grown up. Both his boys grew up in his absence because he was in jail. Those boys... The boys of a die-hard patriot, the wife of a die-hard patriot, serving officer, are facing the stigma of being a terrorist family. And nobody writes about them. A terror-accused girlfriend is not eating Chinese these days is a story which covers half a page of a day, national daily. Such is the, uh, the partiality of our narrative. Somebody should go and meet Dr. Aparna Purohit. How she has been fighting his case when he was in jail and when he came out of jail, both. And how the boys grew up with their father being a terror accused. Imagine how they used to go to school, what they used to face. And all the social and psychological complications those children must have grown up with. So there is so much to talk about. It is difficult to put it in a book. My effort has been to put the... Uh, the high points of the case, my principal thrust has been to give the political background and the perspective which led to the creation of this bogey of Hindu terror and why the two, three things on which Colonel Sahab continues to face a terror tra trial, how those do not add up as per the evidence. That is the planting of the RDX, that is his association with Abhinav Bharat and these two, three things which are actually, you know, when you, when you bring it down to the basics, these are the two, three things which, on which he is facing the entire case. Yehi toh hai, itna hi toh hai, ki RDX joh plant hua wo unke paas se mila, aur abna bharat se unka sambanth, aur kya hai? I mean, when you come down to brass tacks, itna hi hai. The rest is all narrative. Fact itna hi hai. So, how that doesn't add up? And I will like to conclude with two or three things, which I would like everybody to ponder, those who will be listening to this podcast eventually and all of your friends here. Number one, you must have all noticed how strict our army is when it comes to discipline and conduct. I have been covering and reading and following so I know 
from uh, Kashmir to Nagaland to Jharkhand to everywhere, you see there is one even small complaint and the army takes the strictest action, disciplinary action against its own people. All of you know that. Colonel Prasad, Lieutenant Colonel Prasad Purohit may have lost out on promotions because of the case, but he continues to be a serving army officer, doing his duty every day. Please do not forget that. Will any army tolerate a terrorist in its ranks if there is any shred of evidence? Tell me. And this has been totally corroborated in the two courts of inquiry, COIs, conducted by the army. Uh, the major operative uh, portions of which I have quoted in my book, I got them with great difficulty because Colonel Saab was not ready to part with anything. He said, I am a law abiding person. I am not going to tell you one line. I am not going to share a piece of paper. You are a reporter. You fend for yourself if you want to write about it. I am a law abiding person. The law does not allow me. I am not going to tell you anything. And he did not. He kept his word till today. So, please factor those two courts of inquiry. If there was any shred of evidence, would the army tolerate a terrorist in its ranks? The army which does not tolerate even the smallest misconduct, would they have let him serve the army? He still continues to serve the army. He is completing, doing all the tasks which he is being assigned officially. So on that note, it is a time, please do not think it is an old case. For the simple reason that it may relate to a blast in 2008, but all the elements continue to be there in the society. It is part of a larger game. Do not look at it as a single incident. The people who played those games are still around. It can be, it can come back any moment. Society needs to remain vigil and we need to remain grateful to those people, those men and women who face all kinds of, you know, trials and challenges just to keep us protected. I have written a line in the beginning of my book, in the, in the first leaf of the book. I have dedicated it to all those unknown, unnamed security persons and intelligence persons who are working day and night to keep us protected, but we do not know them. Without naming them, let us all be thankful to them and let us be grateful to them. Let us not do to them what we did to Colonel Prasad Purohit. Thank you, friends. Ma'am, it was a very nice presentation. Thank you. And thank you for doing a very good uh, research work on Colonel Prasad Purohit. And uh, other than the very uh, emotional part of it, his family suffering, because I remember his wife, seeing his wife when it happened in 2008, it was horrible. Nobody stood up for him. Uh, there are a few things, uh, points that I would like to put, even questions too. Like, why didn't the army stand up for Colonel Purohit, number one? There were surely some bad eggs in the army too, fixing up Colonel Purohit. I don't think any actions have been taken even now. Secondly, uh, there is also this, um, I'm sure you're a very well-known journalist, you would be knowing it better than me. Um, like during this 2611 thing, they had planned that uh, Sandeep Dange and uh, Ramachandra Kal Sangra, uh, they were very much in the custody, they were killed, and they were planned to sort of put the whole blame on them. And then they were shifted to the hospital, I think it was KEM or something. So this was, uh, it has been told by uh, Inspector Munjewar, Mohamed Munjewar. No action has been taken even till now about it. Not only that, both uh, Sadi Pragya and Colonel Purohit had written letters from that time about custodial uh, torture, Tortures. third degree torture. And they had mentioned about uh, Parambir Singh, who was given promotions, mind you, by all governments, even the BJP government. So. I mean, there are other cases running on him regarding some Maharashtra stuff, but he has never been questioned for this. When do we take actions on people yeah, yeah, regarding right, these? Right. So when do we take action? I have no answer. I am a news reporter. Only the government can answer. Only those who take decisions can answer when we will take action. But yes, two, three things. I will take up your last point first regarding the tortures. 
uh, there are there is a long chapter in my book on the tortures that he went through and I started by giving some graphic details of the tortures but it became so gory and it became so difficult I had to stop. So I have not given the entire picture of the tortures but I have given as much as was possible for me as a human being to explain. Please read those chapters and you will understand what he has gone through. Just because he was serving his motherland and he was not ready to compromise with the enemies of the nation. Ma'am, I just wanted to interfere, you know, you, you keep referring to the book, but it will be great if you talk about some of these things about the RDX, uh, some... Uh, ah, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So, the it's a long story. Through. The story is long, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. First, I'll start with the, first on the tortures. The tortures are horrible. They are horrible, they have injured Colonel Purohit forever. But more than that, it is the emotional impact of the fact that a serving army officer doing his duty was being tortured for serving the nation by people, other people who were also in uniform is the worst part of it. And they used to keep talking among themselves while the tortures were going on. Dekh abhi ek army ke officer ka kya hal banata hun. Okay? And he refused to compromise. He was asked to make certain compromises. He refused to compromise. In between, there was an effort to bump him off. But kya hua? Before getting caught in this case, he used to give, now see the irony of the situation. It is so ironical. He used to give regular training sessions to the Mumbai ATS, Maharashtra ATS, because he was so good in his job of intelligence gathering that he used to go there to give sessions, classes. So, one of the policemen, one of the junior policemen who had attended one or two of his lectures was so admiring of him. He was so, he admired him so much that he didn't execute the order to kill him. And he caught his feet and he said, sir, I take you as a guru. Please don't come out. If you come out, I'll have to do something because I'm under orders. You stay inside. Such was the things. And I'm not going to any more details. I'm going to stop here. As for the RDX. As for the RDX, uh, it's a little complicated and it's long also to explain the whole sequence, but I'll try to put it briefly for in a common, common person's language. So what happens is this, there is this ASI Bagde of ATS, okay? He comes from Nasik ATS office and he's looking for a quarter. He's looking for the quarter and he asks uh, uh, an army officer in the army station, for the address ki wo, wo ghar kidhar hai, wo sudhakar ka makan kidhar hai. So they tell him that you go, they give him the direction to the house and there were a lot of reporters surrounding that army station at that time because Colonel Saab had already been arrested and after those few days of illegal arrest, he had been shown as arrested on record and he was in jail in the, actually in the ATS custody. So reporters were swar you know, going swarming around this army station. So this army officer, you know, he had presence of mind and he thought, why is a stranger asking for an address? So he informed his CEO. So there was a senior officer there, Khanzode. So Khanzode was a very sharp officer and Khanzode immediately became suspicious. And he said, you go and stop that fellow. Who is he? What is his identity? Why does he want this house to have the address? And eventually they conveyed the message to Pune command officer, southern command also. Meanwhile, what happened was these two fellows, they went quickly with a, on a scooty to check why this fellow Bagdai was looking for the house. When they went there, he was coming out. So, no, so he called and he said, they asked him, did you get the house? He said, no, 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 now there is no need to need the address because I've got a call from my office that we don't need to find that house anymore. I've been called back for an urgent work. I'm going back. Please don't worry. So they said, okay, fine, the matter is over. But somehow, uh, the second, the, the officer who had given the address, he was not convinced. You know, his sixth sense worked. And he said, let's go and check out that house. So they took a scooty and they went to check that room, that quarter. When they went there, the back door of the quarter was open. Even though no one was living there and it was supposed to be locked. The back door of the quarter was open. So they went along, you know, they, they, sorry, they circuited the uh, campus and they went to the back door of the house. 
and the back door was wide open and Bagade was rubbing something on the floor. Okay? And later on, and then he suddenly, he was, he, you know, he was very sort of flustered when he saw them. They said, what are you doing here? You said you have been called back. So we just came to check just in case. But you said you are going back. He said, no, 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 I was going back. Then I was asked to come back. He said, but how did you open the door? Who gave you the keys to this door? This is not your house. What has ATS got to do this with this uh, room? How was he able to open the door? Nobody knows. Who gave him the lock? The lock was not broken. It was opened properly. The lock was opened properly. And from that same Sudhakar's house, they later reported that they got traces of RDX, which means RDX was stored in that room. It was used to store there. And it was stored because they had plans to sort of conduct some more blasts. And so the same room must have been used for RDX, which was used in Malegaon. And they sent it for forensic, forensic test. And they tried to prove that this RDX was the same that was used in the Malegaon blast. Yes. According to the forensic report, the RDX was the same. But did Colonel have it put there or what? Or was it someone else who came post blast in November and put those traces of the thing which was later found that the, AT, the forensic team found all those traces on the RDX is one thing. Second thing, Nitin, Captain Nitin sir, you know, uh, I mean, the Gawahi, the testimony of Captain Nitin. What happened to Captain Nitin? It's again a very long tale, but I'll put it in two, three lines. Nitin was another, he's a retired army officer. I think he lives in Thane, but whatever, we should maintain his privacy. So Nitin was a captain in the army, but he had uh, sort of uh, taken a short, uh, this thing, short duration service. And he had started teaching in this uh, uh, school, in Nasik, Bhonsala, the military academy, he had started teaching there. So, in, because he, he was a very intelligent officer and he had some common friends with Colonel Purohit, so they had become friends. So, he had started to admire Colonel Purohit as a senior and as a great, you know, intelligence officer, great admiration and they had become good friends. So, Nitin Joshi was called by the ATS and he was told, that uh, a team came to his school and they took him away and they put him in custody and they told him that you give a uh, you give a statement that Colonel Purohit has been sharing his thoughts about doing all this and all his ideas and you say this this he was given a line of statement that he was supposed to repeat so he said I'll not do it so they kept him in custody in Mumbai, Kalina Me, ATSK. And then first they intimidated him, they threatened him, and then they took him to the room where Colonel Purohit was being tortured. And they said, You see what we are doing to him? We will do worse to you. We will do worse with you, and we will do the same to your family. And you will have no face to show to the society. So you better give a statement. And they scared him so much that in the court, he gave a statement on the lines of what they desired. Nitin Joshi, Nitin Dattatre Joshi, the full name. So, Captain Joshi gave the statement. It was used as evidence. But immediately, and, and then immediately when he gave the statement, they went and dropped him in Nasik. You know, they, they, they took him in a car and dropped him there. But he was so overcome with guilt. He was so overcome with guilt, he was unable to forgive himself. You know, that because of his statement, a friend whom he admires so much will be sort of implicated. So he was so overcome with guilt and he thought, what is the point of this life if because of me, my friend is going to be hanged. And in the meantime, that school also, rustic, uh, so, I mean, they terminated his services because he had become embroiled in a terror thing. So, they also removed him from service because there was pressure from the government to remove him from the job. So, he was not a teacher, a trainer there anymore. So, then he could, he didn't know what to do because he had already given a statement in the law court. So, 
he wrote a very long petition to the State Human Rights Commission in Maharashtra, where he explained his entire experience. And that petition I have quoted. So, he also went there. Similar was the story with, uh, there is a sadhu, there is a yogi who has been quoted as one of the prime witnesses. He was also threatened in the same manner. So, this is the story of the RDX. It is a bogus uh, sort of evidence. It is not an evidence, it is a creation of an evidence. Such is the story of the statement of uh, Captain Nitin Joshi, such is the story of some other uh, witnesses. So, nobody should be surprised about the fact that this case has been going on and on and on and there is a day to day hearing in the NIA court, but every witness who comes to the court turns hostile. They turn hostile because it was never a fact, it was a built up thing. So, let us wait for the law courts to come to a conclusion. Follow up question two perhaps, uh, who wanted him taken out, why was he such a big you know problem. problem. So, he was a big problem because he had come to know about a very big world level terrorist meeting with a very senior politician, one on one meeting in Indian soil. He was a problem because he had uh, unearthed the entire nexus of Simi, of Pakistan and the left wing terrorism and how they were all collaborating with each other in terms of money and arms. He had traced their links with elements in Nepal, their entire you know conduit how it works, you know all those things and you see it is things become things prove themselves, things prove themselves nobody has to make an effort for to do it. All those things which he had predicted will happen because such is the plan because he had penetrated so deep into their nexus that he had come to know everything. All those things he had predicted when whatever we saw later happening in Karnataka, the PFI and all that, it is all in his reports which are there with the government. But there is such a large network of people who are privy to these reports. Oh, by the way, I will just add one line about Parambir. I am not going to make a judgment on Parambir. He is also a uniformed man, has been. But I am just saying that we keep, we vilify Hemant Karkare so much and everybody knows what he did. But we forget that Parambir was number two. And Hemant Karkare was only passing the instructions. The actual torture was being done under the supervision of Parambir. I mean, one big politician was able to get this executed via police and whoever else. No, 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 no. That's a valid question. Yeah, no. That big, that one politician's thing is only because uh, it would have become a huge embarrassment. I am saying there was this entire effort to create this false equivalence, you know. Of Hindu terror. Yeah. And who is behind this? Why is this narrative so important and to whom? To have Hindu terror. To those who want to give a safe passage to the other terror because uh, it panders to their political games. I think it is still going on. In one state, uh, they have just won the election and see the change that has come on the ground. I mean, what do I need to say more? So, why are we still afraid to name the UPA government? No, no, I have written the UPA government, I have named, named the ministers also. We are not afraid to name the UPA government. I mean, who was the government at that time? I am not even afraid to name the Congress NCP government in Mumbai because Mumbai was the biggest player. I mean, it all happened in Mumbai. It may have been instructed and planned in Delhi, but please remember there were guys in Mumbai ready to do it. They could have refused. So, do not forget Mumbai. Mumbai is as much a, a part of this whole plan as Delhi is. Do not always single out Delhi. But should we be afraid because uh, there have been attacks on you, on your book, even threats to your life? Would you like to talk about that? See, it is very interesting and it gives a sense of the way things operate. I faced nothing during the course of writing my book. I think it was also because I wrote it very quietly. Nobody except my family knew. And when the book came out, some of my friends did not talk to me for many weeks. So, I did not say because I did not want the word to spread before it was done because I did not know if I will be able to do it, you see. The challenges I faced, I mean remember the people who were closest to him were not ready to share with me anything. Forget about anybody else. So, I did not know if I will be able to complete this project. I was not sure the kinds of things I had been facing. So, I did not tell anyone. So, the threat started after the book came out, not 
during the course of writing the book and that includes my publisher. The biggest threat was when the book launch was planned in Pune. I think about 400 people were detained that day by Pune police and I had to be escorted under heavy security support to reach the venue of the launch of my book and that entire street had been cordoned off. Only people who had valid QR coded invites were allowed to reach the venue. Even I was stopped from reaching the venue. At three places, they had to verify my photo ki aap hi nahi kitab likhi hai. In case I am not a plant. And there were about half a dozen IPS officers and a whole posse of police force. Such was the protest, level of protest that they had been doing for three, four days against the book launch. So one big hurdle was having the book launched. But it was so beautiful. It was, it was so humbling to see the class of people who had come to the event. And the, 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 the look of greatness on their eyes. I mean, it, it really made me emotional, you know. They, everybody coming to tell me thank you for writing this. And till today I get messages, you know, from strangers. The most touching are the messages which come from strangers, not from people I know. Who fish out my number and my Twitter uh, link and things. They, tried, they try all sorts of sources to able to reach me just to say thank you, Smitaji, for writing this. So, that is why I have faith in the society and our people. I told you, when everything else will fail, the wisdom of the people will rise. So, that was one. So, as I said, the real threat started after the book came out, not while I was writing it, because not many people knew I am writing it. There were threats to our publisher. And I want to take this uh, opportunity to put it on record that the bravery is actually not mine. I mean, I can write anything I want at home. The bravery is of Vitasta Publishing. The bravery is of Renu Kolvarmaji, who took the courage to publish my book when everybody else was not ready, because they said it is uh, subjudice. I said it was subjudice when RSS Ki Sazish was launched in Mumbai, okay. So, that is one. However, we have kept things low-key and uh, there were all kinds of questions. You see, nobody believes a, a, a woman will write a book on such a thing because they just think that what is this girl's army in the army? You know, the, we are still so patriarchal in certain sectors, not in everything in life. So, what do you know? So, the allegations are number one, what do you know? Who has written it? Who has written it? Who has written it? Who has You know, as if I am so dumb, you know, I can take dictation and anybody will make me write a book on such a subject. Secondly, who has written it? Who has written it? Thirdly, Colonel Purohit ne apna case mazboot karne ke liye likhwa hai. Paise, pata karo kitne paise mila, inko kitna mila, publisher ko kitna mila. To they can check our bank accounts and find out kya mila hai, nahi mila hai. Or kitna hamari taraf se gaya hai. That is one. And then this uh, thing about, you know, who is behind this project. And then questions about why, uh, what is my interest in writing the book? I don't have an army background. We are not related to Colonel Purohit or his family. We are not friends. I came to know him only because of this case. And we have no association and there are no professional. So why would I write a book? What is my interest? And I have been asked this question in as many words. I am a citizen of India. The security of my country is as much my concern as anybody else. If I see something about the security of my country, I feel I, I should write about it. I don't have to have a family relationship or professional relationship. If something else happens, I will write about that too. And I'm trained as a reporter. Everything makes me curious. I want to know iske piche kya baat hai. Ye jo lag hai, ye nahi hai. So that is how it is. But yes, the questions continue. I told you, abhi tak to mujhe itna hi mila hai ki wo jo completely unknown stranger se messages aate hain. A 16, 17-year-old girl sends me a message on Twitter, Smitaji, I am the daughter of a MI officer. This is the first time in the history of the country somebody has written the pain of an intelligence officer's family. Thank you so much for writing it. And then a retired veteran calls me from Chandigarh. He's about 90 now. And he tells me that he's the great grandson of one of the uh, most famous personalities of this country. I will not name. And he says, thank you so much. You wrote this book, I want to bless you. So, abhi tak to mujhe itna hi mila hai. But the questions continue. 
I guess it's too much for people to digest, so they will raise questions. I, I mean, we have to take it on our chin.